Welcome back to my YouTube page and today I'm going to be tackling one of the toughest topics there is to M14s and that's building them on your own. The goal of this video is going to be building an M14 from the ground up from a hobbyist perspective. Again, if you're watching this video and you don't know who I am, uh, I'm not a professional gunsmith. I'm an enthusiast. I'm a hobbyist. Um, I've been bitten by the M14 bug very heavily. I read a lot of posts from very well-known respected professionals and I also call a few of them on the phone to get their advice on things or I contact other members who've built quite a few M14s as well and get their advice and what I'm attempting to do here today is to filter out a lot of the myths that there are to building M14s. I'm going to attempt to show you everything that's involved in inspecting and building your own M14 in a safe manner. A functional M14 that's not going to blow up on you or that's going to jam up on you. This first part is receiver inspection. And during this receiver inspection it's very important to address any issues before you actually start uh, grinding away on your receiver or screwing any barrels on or lapping any bolts. This is a very critical point in your build process because uh, once you reach a point, there's there's what I call the point of no return, where if you don't know what you're doing and you don't know what to look for, you can start tweaking on a receiver and then you void any, any chances that you had of a warranty uh, if you don't know what you're doing. If you find a really critical issue, it's best to send it back to the manufacturer for a refund or a replacement with a detailed explanation of what you found. So hopefully by the end of this video you'll have a better idea of the kind of skills that you're going to need to pull this off in a really good way uh, without it being a disaster. Uh, an idea of the price that you're going to invest or the cost of the tools that you're going to invest in to build a, a safe rifle and weigh those costs and risks out and decide whether or not you want to send your kit to a builder and pay the two to six hundred dollars whatever they're gonna charge you to, to put your kit together or whether or not you're gonna go ahead and, and brave this yourself I'm gonna tell you if you work on your car uh, on your own and you spend more money sending it back to a mechanic shop to fix what you've broken you probably shouldn't be building M14s especially something uh, with you know so many thousands of PSI going off right next to your face okay um, you really wanna know what you're doing you really wanna do your homework and you don't want to cut any corners. And even if you do cut corners, you better better be sure of what you're doing before you pull the trigger on your first round. Now while this video series is going to be very lengthy, once you've done it and after you've spent some time researching it and practicing, uh, building M14s probably doesn't really take a whole lot of time. Okay, it, it, it takes more time trying to figure out what to do, how to do it, and if you're doing it right the first time. After that, it's all repetition. So let's get started and look at the equipment and parts that you're going to need before you start turning barrels on your receiver. Okay, what I have here are what I consider to be the bare minimum amount of items that you're going to need to safely build your rifle. Okay, obviously you're going to need your receiver. Make sure you pick a good one. You're going to need an angle finder, or at least I, I like to use the angle finder for different things. Uh, the operating rod spring guide that you're going to use or a GI one or a good quality one a good quality or the actual operating rod you're going to use for your build a complete bolt set a bolt stop and a pin and a connector pin a GI magazine a nice high power flashlight the flash suppressor that you plan on using on your build I can't stress this enough you need to use the one that you plan on using on your build um, a 10-piece PTG or um, Forrester headspace gauge set, a split 308 Winchester case, the barrel that you plan on using on your build or a GI barrel. I put both here just to show you, yes, this is the one I'm going to use for my build, but um, what you can do is sometimes you can use the GI uh, takeoff barrel to use as kind of a, a, a control sample. Okay, uh, this is a, a, a decent condition Winchester one. A set of barrel timing gauges from Badger Ordnance. 
a complete GI rear sight set or the set you plan on using on your build and a complete trigger group assembly. Now this here, this barrel that I'm going to use today is a John Wolf modified medium weight 5R20 stainless barrel. And this one is short chambered, okay, meaning that in the end, at the end of the day, we're going to actually have to ream the headspace on this chamber to what I want. Now this down here, this is a Winchester uh, GI barrel, a takeoff barrel, and it's chrome lined. Now chrome lined barrels, you can't really set the headspace. If you do want to set the headspace, you either have to lap the bolt lugs or you have to get a carbide chamber reamer and ream out the chamber that way to set the headspace if it's too tight. Okay, and if it's too loose, then you need another barrel. Oh, and another thing you're going to need is a Sharpie or magic marker or some uh, die chem blue black. So we'll go ahead and put that with our list of recommended items. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is going to go over the receiver now. I didn't mention this in my previous scene, but if you can obtain um, what's called an optivisor or some kind of a magnifying glass that you can use to inspect your receiver very closely, it's going to really be very, very helpful in helping you identify any issues that you might, might have. So if you can get an optivisor, Basically, it's the thing that you wear around your head with some magnifying glasses on it, or if you can get a magnifying glass or some kind of a jeweler's loop, um, you can use that to, res to, to inspect the receiver for any defects that you can't see with the naked eye. Okay. And again, it's nice to have a good flashlight handy, and it really helps you see, especially because the whole receiver <clears throat> is parkerized black. Sometimes it's hard to see, um, you know, anything. So, you know what you want to do, like inspect the rear sight serrations. Make sure they're nice and crisp. Uh, look at your rear sight deck, make sure it's nice and smooth, uh, that there aren't any obvious high spots, or if one side's higher than the other, um, that will definitely cause you some problems. Okay, again, uh, look inside, especially where the where the bolt travels, okay, and look for any obvious, uh, you know, high spots that might be a problem. Um, make sure you have the proper firing pin channel cut out or the relief of the firing pin. Okay. Make sure the bolt stop ears are in good condition. And check for any cracks around your safety bridge. Uh, if you bought a used receiver there is a slight possibility that it could have a crack in the in the safety bridge. Check out your bolt lug cutouts. Again make sure there's no uh, no obvious burrs or high spots. Uh, everything should be nice and, and crisp and smooth. Especially your left bolt cutout, your left lug bolt cutout. That's probably the toughest part of the whole receiver to manufacture the proper way, okay? And there are some GI or some bolts that you can't even turn, that you can't even lock into battery because the left bolt cut area, the, this area right here, wasn't machined the proper way, okay? Visually inspect your receiver threads. Make sure they're nice and clean, again, that there's no burrs or any defects inside the threads, okay? Um, Make sure you pay attention to the face of the receiver. Make sure it's perfectly flat. If you have any um, any precision flat ground instruments, uh, that would be really useful in, in checking this area. Now again, if you happen to be lucky enough to have access to any kind of precision flat machine piece of steel or a slab of granite, um, you can also check perpendicularity right, of your receiver face. And this one here is just beautiful. It's spot on. Um, and uh, there's there's no daylight there that you can see. Um, so this is a, a perfectly perpendicular receiver face, and it's going to be really good. It's going to be ensure that uh, when you screw your barrel on, it's going to go on straight. It's not going to be cattywampus from the center line of the uh, of the of the receiver threads. All right. So the next thing you're going to do is going to get your strip bolt, okay, and you're going to slide it into the receiver, okay, and ensure. That when you wrote that when it goes in battery, that you can um, that you can rotate it. Now without a barrel in there, um, and without an operating rod or anything else or a trigger group, it's going to kind of flop around on you. So you just have to make sure that you can rotate it forward and rotate it, okay, and fully lock the lugs. Okay. Another thing is when you do fully rotate it, make sure that when this is fully engaged, you can still rotate that bolt roller. And that you have about a you know um, some some kind of a gap. I think the spec is ten thousandths, and that appears to be about what it is. Okay, so you want to make sure that those are good. Now, there's a lot of receivers. A lot of times, people have uh, gone to build their receiver, 
and this left bolt lug won't even rotate in because this left side of the receiver was machined improperly. Okay, um, and in this case, that's not the case. And the other area of clearance is right here. This is the, the safety, kind of a safety lug. I'm not sure of the exact terminology, um, but that one needs to be able to rotate fully as well. Okay. Now it's time to screw your barrel onto your receiver um, as tight as you can get it by hand. And that's good enough. So go ahead and put your bolt back on the receiver. And now all you really want to do is run it forward and backwards to make sure that it um, that it rotates and it doesn't hang up on the barrel. Now obviously it's hand tight right now and the barrel isn't exactly um, tightened down all the way and it's going to go a few more degrees. But again, you just want to make sure that it rotates freely. Um, if it's already binding up on the barrel right now, you're really going to have some problems already. Now it's time to flip the action over and put the firing pin in your bolt. Okay. Now insert a 5 30 seconds punch into the extractor hole at the front of the bolt. Push forward on the firing pin with your thumb. Now rotate the bolt and make sure the firing pin cams smoothly and evenly into the firing pin channel. Keep, keep pressure applied on the firing pin and now grab your punch and rotate the bolt out of battery and make sure that the pin cams out smoothly from the firing pin channel. And what you're really looking for is to make sure that you actually can with pressure, rotate the bolt without any excessive force. This means your safety bridge is shaped properly. Now rotate the bolt out of battery, pull it back just a little bit, push in on the firing pin to uh, make sure it's fully extended in through the bolt. And as you move your bolt forward, you should see the firing pin get pushed back by the safety bridge. Okay? And as it rotates, the firing pin should remain retracted and there is a fully extended firing pin. And again, when you rotate, it should slide right back out. Now remove your firing pin, pull the bolt all the way back, insert your split 308 case, your hammer spring, and the back of the 308 case. Now bring the bolt forward. Now put your punch in the extractor hole and push forward and rotate the bolt in the battery. And now pull it out. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to get our flashlight, okay, and we're going to shine it underneath the bolt. Uh, probably somewhere for the for the right bolt lug, you basically want to shine light right between where the bolt lug and the receiver meet. Now it takes a little bit of practice, but what you're looking for is some daylight, okay? So as we look in there, let's see if I can... Now you're going to see a little bit right there on the bottom right corner, uh, but that's that's the relief cutout that's supposed to be there. But as you rotate the bolt around, you can see just a little tiny sliver of light indicating that the right bolt lug is not really contacting. However, it's so small that as soon as we lap for contact, it's not going to take excessive... Con it, it's not going to take excessive bolt lapping to get this bolt to fit perfectly okay uh, but what it shows me is there's just we're talking minimal amount of lapping but you, what you'll notice is that the helix cuts um, are just perfect between the bolt and the receiver okay and you can do the same thing for the um, for the other lug what I can see is that just on the very outside portion of the left bolt lug there's just a little high spot that just needs to be lapped out but again it's so thin it's, it's you know 
uh, probably maybe one, maybe a thousandth of an inch or something like that, just enough so the light creeps through and you can see it. So what you're doing here is you're checking for bolt lug contact. And that's going to give you a good idea of how much work you have to make this bolt uh, work correctly with the receiver. Now it's very rare to get a bolt and receiver combination that made up perfectly without any lapping. But this is a pretty good example of um, the kind of uh, tolerances and, and, and contact that you should um, that you should have when you start your build um, to ensure that you don't have to do a whole lot of lapping. Um, so this, so even though there's just we're talking a slight, slight amount of light that ca that escapes between both bolt lugs, um, that's nothing to be concerned about and nothing to reject the receiver about. It just means that the bolt and the receiver need to be lapped together, and that's expected uh, out of nearly every uh, M14 that you're gonna that, that's ever been built, uh, at least in civ in the civilian world. Um, that's a condition to be about expected. Um, now go ahead and remove the hammer spring and the split 308 case from the action. Alright, now what we're going to start with is with your bolt back, uh, not quite all the way, but a little bit. What we're going to do is we're going to tilt the receiver forward and if all is well, the bolt should slide home and rotate in the lock position when it gets to the end. So it should take no more than 30 to 45 degrees for this to happen. And basically it did. Just like that. And you can see right there, the bolt basically closed under its own weight. Fully locked, fully closed, no binding. And this is the condition that you want. Now if there's any binding, what's going to happen is you're going to have something going on here in the left bolt lug area or somewhere here how the, how the bolt interfaces with the barrel head. What we're going to do now is we're going to install these barrel timing gauges onto the rear sight and the front sight base on the flash suppressor. Now if you don't have barrel timing gauges but you want to know how your barrel times, um, here's an indication. And what you're looking at are the feed ramps, this center of the feed ramp here. So in a perfect world, this feed ramp will be machined exactly at the six o'clock position. So when the barrel is screwed on perfectly where the front sight's at 12 o'clock, this will be down at six o'clock. However, it's not a perfect world and sometimes these feed ramps aren't exactly machined precisely or they're not machined in the right spot. Um, so this can be a little bit misleading, but this position right here uh, is approximately 30 degrees, okay, uh, before top dead center. Okay, so this barrel index indexes at about 30 degrees. And what you're looking for is a barrel that ind indexes somewhere between, say, 15 to uh, 15 degrees to um, to 20 degrees, really. Um, although some other people say uh, 30 to 45 degrees. Now, 45 degrees is a little much. This now, what you're looking at right here, this tip, if this tip right here is just before this ridge. Now if this tip right here, it's just before this ridge, okay, you see how it's there? Um, I think an ideal spot is basically between the, the uh, operating rod spring guide and this left bolt lug bridge here. So what I probably want is my fee ramp to index somewhere about where this position is here just a little bit more so it's 30 degrees I want to bring it somewhere around between 15 to 20 degrees is where I want it so I don't over torque the receiver okay um, I th if it indexes somewhere out here that might that's definitely a little tight and what you need to do is have the the shoulder uh, turned but we're gonna check with headspace gauges anyway okay okay so what you see here is the action set up hand timed in a vise and what I've done as I've zeroed out, I put this angle finder on top of this um, barrel timing gauge that's attached to, it replaces the front sight, it clamps onto the front sight, and it uses your front sight as a degree reference. Okay, now in a perfect world, this should, the front sight should be, the front sight base on the flash suppressor should be machined perfectly. Okay, so we clamp it on there and we throw the angle finder on here, and we set, we rotate it in the vise until it's zero degrees. Okay, and then you see you have a jig 
uh, nearly similar and it clamps in the rear sight pocket around the receiver. Okay. And just a close up on that you can see my angle finder is set to zero degrees. Okay. And again this is just a crude way of uh, or more of a coarse way. This is a coarse way of checking your barrel timing. Um, when you actually screw the barrel onto the action you want to use a more precise uh, leveling device. But this one here shows degrees and it's coarse enough to get you in the ballpark. Okay, so what you're basically going to do is you're going to hold this angle finder right. Um, you're just going to hold it by hand onto the rear sight timing gauge. And right now it's reading somewhere about, around 31, maybe 31 and a half degrees. So now you know that your barrel hand times at 31 degrees. Okay, so now it's time to figure out what your headspace is going to be. Okay, you're going to get your strip bolt and you're going to place it in the receiver. Okay. First you want to do is get your 1. 1.630 headspace gauge and we're going to slide it in. We're going to make sure that the bolt actually closes. Now this is the minimum headspace. Now if your bolt won't close on this freely there's problems. But right here we can see it closes no problem. It just swallows it. And that's what we want because um, I'll show you the formula here in a little bit. Okay and then the next thing we're going to do is see if it closes on a no-go gauge. Now this one actually does not fully close on a no-go gauge. And a no-go gauge is 1.636 inches. So the next step is to try to figure out exactly what your headspace is going to be. Now before you do this step, okay, um, it's a good indication, like I said, this is going to require just a little bit of bolt lapping, not a whole lot. Uh, but that's going to change your headspace measurements. So these readings are just to get an idea of what is to come not quite closing on 1.634. Now it's fully closed here on 1.633, okay? It's uh, it's fully engaged and uh, so that's basically the headspace before you tighten down your barrel, okay? Now one degree equals 0.000277 inches, okay? So what I calculated is I as I get that degree and I multiply it by 30 and that tells me what my headspace is going to be when I time this in at 12 o'clock. So it should set the bolt back or it should set the barrel back uh, about eight thousandths of an inch. So what we have right now is what we have a 1.633 headspace gauge in there which means this is going to this is going to basically time in at about 1.625. Okay now minimum is 1.630 so this one, this particular barrel here, um, you're either going to have to lap the bolt lugs um, a couple of thousands. Now the case hardening on the bolt lug and the receiver, the spec is between 12 to 18 thousandths. Okay, so say if you lapped, uh, you know, three or four thousandths, if you lapped three thousandths off of each one, that would basically put you at 1.631. A little tight for a, for a GI, uh, you know, for a GI chrome line barrel, but it's definitely. Um, definitely workable with this particular receiver. However, like I said, this is a GI, an old Winchester GI receiver. Um, there's no telling what a Criterion uh, current production, which I think they're pretty much made to work a lot better with LRB receivers. And also, um, this barrel is actually not going on this rifle. Uh, this is my Wolf modified medium weight uh, stainless steel barrel, and it's going to be short chambered anyway. So I'm basically going to ream my chamber to get my proper headspace. So this is only an issue if you have a chrome lined barrel. Okay. And honestly with today's technology, uh, chrome lined barrels, um, I really don't see much of a need for them. I like chrome molly barrels. They're, they're, they seem to be uh, really good high quality, uh, high quality barrels and I like being able to ream my own headspace uh, to custom length. Now you could get a gunsmith that has a carbide reamer and he can, when he tightens this down, you check your headspace if it's too tight, then he could get a carbide reamer and he can extend the headspace for you. You're pretty much done with the barrel now, so I went ahead and took it off. Now your next step is to check out the pocket in the rear sight pocket in the receiver. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your complete rear sight assembly apart, okay, and you're just going to get your base and your aperture assembly and you're going to put it 
on the uh, on the rear sight in the rear sight pocket. Okay. So now what you're doing, I'm going to do is you're going to slide the receiver left to right, and you're going to make sure that the ears of the receiver actually go underneath the the rear sight base. Okay. Um, if they don't, then that means that you're going to have to take some material off of either the rear sight or off of the receiver. Okay, and then check the other side as well. And again, just do the same thing for the left side. Push all the way down, slide it over, and just make sure that it clears the right side here. Next thing you're going to do is go ahead and put your receiver together without the dust cover. Screw in your pinion screw until it just clunks. Okay, so we've heard it clunk once, and this is our sweet spot. So what you want to do is you want to run the windage all the way to the right as far as it'll go. Again, what we're looking for is that when you turn it all the way to one side, that the rear sight base goes over the ear of the receiver. And now back it off and do the same thing for the left side. At some point in time, you're going to run out of thread. Okay, so it's actually off the uh, it's actually off the windage screw. Okay, go ahead and center it back up. Now the other thing you want to do that you want to check for is you're going to turn it off, turn it on its side, or you're going to look at the profile view, and you're going to make sure that this cutout right here. Um, is above the aperture, okay, um, the aperture body as it slides up and down there. So as you look on it dead on, the aperture should not be sticking above this plane of the of the rear sight. Go ahead and tighten it one more clunk just to make sure you have some really good positive uh, engagement on your windage. So now what we're going to do is we're going to check to make sure that the windage adjustments are nice and solid and you can see it snapping into place. Okay, and, uh, and as I tighten the screw, this screw, uh, this fit between the receiver and the, or the, uh, and the windage knob will get tighter as well. So, um, although you see some slop in there, when I tighten this up, that slop's going to go away. Okay, so everything's good there. Now we're going to check for nice solid elevation clicks. And that's down, it's already down and that the elevation, or the rear side, you're also going to check that the rear side aperture moves uh, moves very nicely. And don't worry about it being loose because there's no dust cover, and the dust cover is a spring that keeps all this stuff together. Now, um, just something else to note is when you move these all the way over, what you want to pay attention for as you move it all the way is if you feel any binding. If it gets tighter to one side or the other, then that means that um, your rear sight base or your deck, the, the deck of your in, in the receiver pocket is not uh, is not perfectly level like it's got a high spot or or there may be a, a raised spot over here so as you move it over if it gets very difficult then that means that there's some binding going on okay and if it's there now um, that means it'll be there when you're shooting it's actually get worse when the rear sight covers in place now it's time to uh, loosen the screw and take the elevation and windage drums out and leave only the rear sight base and the aperture and then put your dust cover on. So now that we have that in there, what you're basically going to do is you're going to push forward on the rear sight base and let it spring back and you're going to look for the spring back motion okay and what that tells you is that there's no binding um, on the rear sight base now that we know all that's in good working order go ahead and put your entire rear sight assembly together okay so I couldn't go any further so I went back one more click. Now I'm pretty sure this is going to be a little tight and I'm probably not going to be able to turn the windage or if I do it's going to be really difficult. Okay, I guess I can. 
Now that the rear sight's been taken care of, we're going to go ahead and check the connector pinhole. Okay, and what you're going to do is just make sure that uh, the connector pin you're going to use actually slides in and out. Okay, we'll just go ahead and slide the pin in. Put your operating rod spring guide in. Slide the pin all the way in, and make sure that your operating rod spring guide moves freely. Okay, if there's any binding here, uh, that may be a cause for reject because what that means is there's an area inside here that uh, this area here may not be relieved properly and that's a high stress area it's right underneath the barrel ring and if you remove the heat treating from that eh, you know things might get a little uh, hairy there okay so the next thing to test is the operating rod that you're going to be using for your build okay um, if it has a really strong tab uh, like this one does, it may or may not fit. So you want to basically put it in the groove and make sure that it does fit and that you can move it forward nice and smooth, uh, forward and back, without any binding. If there's any binding, there may be some high spots, especially within the uh, operating rod tab track that uh, might not have gotten milled or finished all the way. Okay, And so you might have to do some more fitting there. At this point, we'll go ahead and have you leave the operating rod spring guide in place and the connector pin. Now we're going to go ahead and put your trigger guard or your trigger housing in. Okay. And what we're going to do is make sure that we actually get a full clamping action here. A little harder to do when the action's out of the stock. Okay. And all we're really looking for is nice, clean insertion. Okay. Without a stock here, it's going to fit kind of sloppy. However, now that you do have the trigger group in place and the operating rod spring guide in place, we'll check the magazine fit. Go ahead and grab your GM magazine or which you know a good quality one, and just make sure that it actually does fit inside the uh, the receiver. Okay. Sometimes the magazine wall for these aren't exactly cleared all the way, so you want to make sure you have a nice, uh, nice clean removal and a nice clean insertion. Now one last final thing to check before you begin your build is to make sure that your receiver fits in the stock that you're going to use. Okay, so if you have a nice GI fiberglass stock or a walnut one or something or um, whichever one it is you're going to use, make sure that it actually does fit in your receiver. Okay, And that when you do push it in, okay, that uh, basically, it seats down nice and flush. What you're really looking for is just to make sure you have a real nice fit around the receiver, okay, and that the front and the back of the receiver will actually seat all the way. Now, if you look through, you're going to see some daylight, which is normal, right here um, around where the uh, operating rod dismount notch is, okay. That was designed into it that way. What you want is contact on the heel and contact in the front. And now what you're going to do is you're going to slide your trigger housing into the stock and make sure it fits good. Make sure you put your safety on too just in case you have to force this down and the hammer might fall forward. Don't ask me how I know. Okay. And I can tell this one's going to be a nice tight fit but it looks like we should be able to get there. And there you go. So now I got a nice tight trigger lockup on this receiver and uh, it's ready to go so don't really have any issues there now what you're also checking for when you put the receiver in the stock is to make sure that the legs actually are shaped the right way um, if they're too wide sometimes what will happen is um, they won't go into the leg cutouts in the stock and so you have to either um, make the legs narrower on the front or the back or wherever it is that it's out of spec or widen up the receiver or just simply glass fit it. Okay, so um, it's nice to know these issues before you start uh, cranking on your receiver and if you find out your receiver is out of spec then you can actually return it um, and let them know what you find out and see what kind of cooperation you get from the receiver manufacturer. That or if you use some people if um, with a shady reputation they may tell you you're an idiot and that uh, 
you shouldn't own an M14 anyway. If that's the kind of response you get from the receiver maker, then you probably should look somewhere else. The last and final part of your inspection should be the bolt stop. Okay, so um, you don't really want to put the, the roll pin in until you're pretty much done with the build and you're really ready to do it. Once it's in, it's pretty much in for life unless you cut everything, destroy it. So what you want to do is get a small Allen wrench or a small drill bit that will fit in that hole and just make sure that uh, that there's no no binding, uh, that the ears are wide enough, and that, uh, you know, just go ahead and, and look on inside there and make sure that everything moves freely the way it's supposed to. Now, what you also want to do is uh, kind of like push up, you want to basically push up on the, uh, the bolt stop, okay, to simulate that there's a spring in there, okay, and then you got your bolt, and you want to make sure that as it moves over, it's clear of the bolt stop. Okay. I don't know if you can see that. You want to make sure that the left bolt lug clears the bolt stop. Okay. Now also, what you can do is, uh, you know, now also what you can do is. Uh, push down on the bolt stop to simulate a uh, empty magazine okay and as you move the bolt forward it should catch the bolt stop and if you flip it back down the bolt should go forward free okay and that's pretty much the last check is just to make sure that that's going to work and with that you should be done with your receiver inspection and you're either ready to return the receiver and address the issues that you found or you're ready to go ahead and build Good luck.